Well, if there's any more obvious difference between where my man Ozzy Guillen Jr. is in Chicago and me in Miami, I think this says it all. One of my favorite people, not only as a co-worker, as a teammate, but as a damn good human being. Welcome to the blend, Ozzy Guillen Jr. How are you, Pana? This is when I get a little bit jealous. I'm good. A little bit cold in Chicago, but this is what you do when you enjoy smoking a nice puro and uh and you're in the cold weather so when you can't get out to your you got to get a quick smoke in you can't get out to your uh, local club here locally this is when we get jealous of people in miami <laughs> well you know it, it builds character that's what it is you got more character than me i'll tell you that so listen I've, I've always wanted to have you on the program because you bring so many different at facets of it you know you're you're a businessman you're 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 you you come from a baseball family. You're into cigars. We you know we've delved in, in sports betting, but let's let's start from the beginning. You know, obviously your name, your last name, you know, is such a powerful thing, especially in the city of Chicago. Your dad played for the White Sox, managed the White Sox, won the World Series for the White Sox. How was it growing up, Gian, in Chicago? You know what it, I. I my my childhood as a as a kid was not as crazy as you would think, meaning my younger years. Uh, we were always in a community. Again, this is pre social media. Um, you know, people. It was always special because obviously people were always very nice. But we were always very, you know, kind of like they got used to us, kind of in the South Side where we were living. Uh, that all changed when Ozzy came back in two thousand four. And again, we were of college age. We were already out drinking, partying, having a good time. Adults. And and that's when it changed. That that's when growing up Gian was very, very different. Social media was coming into place. Again, we were old enough to go out. We, you know, you're you're getting free drinks here, a free meal here. And and that's when I that's when it was different. That's when I, I people always ask me, like growing up as a as a kid, no, as a as a young adult, it it definitely blew my mind on how different it was. And again, it was Ozzy back in the limelight as a manager and us being of the age of being going out, that's when it got crazy. And it was been great. I, I still live here, even with this cold weather. Now, when did you realize, and I, I'm always curious of this, when did you realize that your dad wasn't necessarily like the other dads, you know, picking up the kids at school and stuff? When did it sort of click that my dad is, is a little different? You know, as a young kid, I, I, I was always very, and I, and I kind of give him crap for it now because he does so many things. Uh, yesterday, we were actually at a at my kid's swim lesson, and he was like a little, very out of it. And I said, you know, when we were young, my mom would drop us off at the lesson, and then she'd go in and do her workouts. It was my mom with my brother and I. My brother, little brother Oni wasn't, Ozzy wasn't born yet, but he's it, all this is very new to him. I, so I thought at the time, it was like, I was like, kind of like missing out because my dad doesn't, you know, take me to my, you know, my swim lesson or my baseball lesson. Because, again, my dad was working and half the time you're traveling. So I think that, you know, I realized who my father was, meaning from the aspect of once I became like a teenager, okay, and I started seeing things differently of like, you know, I started seeing people make a big deal of, oh, you know, Frank Thomas, for example. And I'm like, yeah, like, it, I didn't think it was a huge deal. And, and when he became the, when he started coaching with the Montreal Expos, when we were already like going into high school. That's when it was very different, okay, uh, that I realized, you know, I have, you know, all these, at the time, current Major League Baseball player, Bobby Abreu, you know, I got, uh, you know, Tim Raines talking to me about baseball and, you know, what do you want to do and what do you want to play? I, I realized very quickly that my my aspect of the way that I saw that, that I've been raised was just very different. The way I saw the game, you know. I'm sitting in my high school game and I'm like, I know more than this high school coach, meaning from a baseball standpoint, I knew, I knew that it was very different that, that, that growing up part uh, was different in the United States and Venezuela has always been different. Cause again, we're a smaller country, you know, uh, Ozzy's always been one of the big leaguers. So I was like, you know, that's, we're, we're Venezuelan famous, but once we were here in high school and we were playing baseball, I said, okay, we, we were definitely not the same as everybody other little kid out there playing on the field. That's what I knew my dad was a little bit different than all my friends' dads. 
so now obviously as, as as an adult now children of your own how, how do you do, did you learn anything from, from ozzy in terms of, of, of being a dad or just the things that maybe he said to you you say now to your kids and stuff and now you look at him and you say okay I, as an abuelo he comes in you know he, he can just wound up for your kids fill them with sugar and leave and you got to deal with it <laughs> You know what? I think that what I've learned is, first of all, I get shocked how young my father was and my mothers were when they were raising, you know, it was a different time. Again, they must, they were in love. They got married. And just to think of the maturity comparison. Okay. I'm, I'm 38 years old. You know, I'm, I'm way more mature. My father at the, the age, my kids are right now, he wasn't even 25 yet. So that aspect of how mature he was and handled that family life, uh, I'm very grateful that that he was so serious about family in his life because I don't know if I had been put in that situation that he was in that I would have been the greatest father as he was. Uh, again, in, in playing baseball and just being around, they were able to be able to keep it together. You know what? I think that for me, sometimes I, I my father's very good at uh, he he's just himself, okay, and he's been very good at if if kids' parents are there and he's he's just very easy easily becomes part of like whatever's going on, even though that his name now, uh, and he's very famous. Like he's just, a, I, he deals with it very well. Sometimes I'm learning how to do that as a parent because I wasn't self-conscious as a kid, but as a parent, I'm, I'm more self-conscious even than my children of, are my children going to be treated different? Are we doing things different? I want to be more normal than normal. You know, I don't want my kids to, to feel like, you know, like, I don't want them to feel like, oh, my parents are doing something completely different and make them feel like outcasted from their kids. So I'm learning that from my parents and my dad that, you know, this is just who we are and you just have to be who you are and not have to really think about what people think or, you know, how they're going to be judged or, or you know, if, if he coaches my kids little league team, you know, how that's going to be viewed. I, I, at times I've been like, I don't think that's such a good idea, uh, which as a, as a kid, I would have just never thought about that. But now as a parent, I'm like, I don't want my kids to get judged. And Ozzy's very good about that, of teaching me, like, you know, we're just regular dudes. This is what I do for a living. I'm just a little bit more famous than other people. I have to be okay with that. And I, that's one of the things that I've learned recently uh, from him on how to handle myself with that. So, obviously, for you, Major League Baseball wasn't in the cards for you. You went on to, you know, to, to in the business world. You've done some television. You've done some stuff with Major League, you know, working for Major League Baseball. Um Tell me how, how you sort of were able to sort of forge your own path. You know what? I think that people don't realize that when you're around the game of baseball, and this is why I'm so grateful. I think the greatest thing the game of baseball has brought to us other than the money that, you know, basically changed my family's and my, you know, everyone in my family's life in Venezuela. It was about who did we have access to? Who was I able to be around and listen and, and, uh, and kind of gain things from osmosis from, you know, I, I grew up in a world where my parents, we'd go back to very humble beginnings. So very, you know, very exposed to like what happens in the day to day street of everybody and in, in, in a normal life. And that was something that in my family, none of my uncles were saying I didn't have any like uncles that were doctors. OK, but because of my dad, who he was and he was Ozzy Guillen, you know, I got exposed to that world. But in, even in the world of baseball, I got exposed to people that were, you know, broadcasting, for example, I'm around the greatest broadcasters ever. Hawk Carrollson's kids are babysitting me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a conversation with an owner of a team. You know, I, I'm in Miami. And at the time, you know, Mr. Hazinga, I, I'm in a meeting, you know, the first time I met him, I was 14 years old. So I'm like, it, I'm, 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 I'm not thinking about it at the time, but I'm realizing that I'm, I'm learning the business, what to do, what not to do, the coaching, what to do, what not to do. So my maturity level in that world, I, I was more mature in that sense, not in other parts of my life, but in that sense of like, I knew what I was good at and not good at. I was very exposed a lot, baseball agents. You know, now that I look at it, I'm like, man, I'm having conversations at 16 years old, you know, with top agents at the time. You know, Scott Boris is asking him, you know, what what should I learn if I want to be a top agent? Like, not thinking about that. Like, no other 16-year-old has that, that ability to do that. So I was very advanced in that world where I knew that very early on, like, if I don't make it as a baseball player, I have all these other facilities that I can use my skill set and get into coaching, get into being a general manager, getting to get into scouting. And, and at the time when I was here, that was when the opportunity came. My father gave me an advice of saying, don't ever be scared of doing anything. If they ask you, you can play left field, you play left field. They ask you if you can catch, you put the gear on uh, because you have to be able to be flexible because it's not when you want something. It's sometimes when the opportunity comes. 
and that's how I got, I got into broadcasting originally very, very early on. Um, I wasn't even a broadcasting major at school at the time. And, and Mitch Rosen heard me, uh, they were doing a pregame, a preseason, uh, like a pregame opening day kickoff. And it was actually not even the White Sox, it was the Cubs. And I got invited by one of the guys and I was just on like talking about, you know, the experience being in Chicago and, and baseball and just talking the game. And he heard me and he said, you know, he liked what he heard. And he said, he brought me in and said, hey, you, do you want to come here, internet to score? And, you know, I want to hear, I want to, I want to, I have this idea about you potentially doing a show with somebody. And I was like, yeah, sure. And that evolved into, at the time, a career where I completely shifted. And I said, I really enjoy broadcasting. I, I was like, I'm, I'm about to jump some steps here. And I kind of worked myself through, I remember the White Sox and my, in my internship, uh, my second internship with the White Sox, they had an internship. They real, Hispanics weren't as cool at the time as like where we're at right now. Now, Major League Baseball, every every team has this. But at the time, the White Sox wanted to like really gain access to the Latino, you know, uh, community. And my intern project was with my bosses were like, how are we going to make this like expansion into the Latino market? And the first thing I thought about was I grew up listening to to Chico Carrasquel in in the booth. And the White Sox didn't have a broadcaster at the time. And I literally drew out the whole project of bringing back the voice in Spanish with myself in mind of like, when they ask me who's the right person, I'm going to put myself up for the job. So knowing early on, I, I would have never had that opportunity early on because before I made this, you know, came up with this idea, I talked to Hawk Carrollson, I talked to Steve Stone of like, do you guys think I could really pull off being a color commentator in baseball? And and they're at, they're, they said you won't know how bad you are until you do it, and and that created a, a whole you know career for me early on where my career got diverted. Of I say you know what I don't want to do I, you know I don't want to be part of like a a front office. I really want to do this broadcasting thing, and I got to broadcast MLB and the NBA. And and, and early in my twenties, this opportunity came and I ran with it, and, and it prepared me. That one prepared me for later in life because then I became a great communicator. I started using that skill set in the business world. And I think it's just always been about, you know, just always be great, always be honest and direct with people and be accountable. And anything you're going to say, even at a young age, like, you know, I was very accountable and I was very direct and always lending a hand. Uh, anyone that said, hey, can you help me with this? If I was able to help them, I would help them genuinely jumping on a show. And I early on in my career, I never thought about how much I was getting paid, maybe because in the financial situation that I was in was not a bad one. But they said, hey, you got to do this. I did it. You got to do. And then that slowly started building up like career wise with all these opportunities started coming up. And that's really where I think that I learned all that from just being early on. I'm just saying, you know what? Nothing's too little. And I wasn't scared of just trying something new. And that built out a whole career in my 20s. And when I woke up one day in my 30s, I'm like, man, I've done I've done a lot. Uh, <laughs> and that really helped out in anything that I was doing. No, again, it, it, and it goes to show the, the job your mom and your dad did in terms of grounding you and your brother, you know, and keeping you guys, you know, your feet on the ground. All right. Well, this is, this is a cigar show. And I'm always, it's the question I always ask everybody, because I don't think we find the cigar. I think the cigar finds us. So Ozzy, how did the cigar find you, buddy? No, absolutely. The cigar finds us. I completely agree with that. I think that uh, like right now I'm smoking a, a Don Alejandro. Um actually met him in my wedding. He was a cigar roller in my wedding. Um, my first cigar that I smoked, uh, I'm, I'm, I was a big Michael Jordan guy. And the first time I went to a cigar shop, I had no idea what a cigar, like what it was, whatever. And I went in, I said, oh, I want to smoke Ashton's because that, that's what Michael Jordan smoked. I smoked, you know, I thought that was like what, you know, the it of it. But I got into it, you know, and I was like a little bit after high school. I think it, it might have been like between my senior year and my uh and my and my freshman year, I I I I smoked my first one, and and I didn't I didn't start smoking consistently uh, until later. I I would say after my thirties, pipe first. I I got into the whole pipe game. I loved collecting them, and I got into the pipe game, and then, um, and then you know what? And then I said, I I I started. I switched. Uh, I said I'm gonna start. I was here in a community. I started going to a spot. And it just became something that I, I I I enjoyed it as the older that I got, you know, I got to relax myself, um, and I started learning about it. And it's become something that what I enjoy about the cigars is that, you know, 
every it's always a new experience for me. You know, I always feel like when I go into the shop, uh, I have my favorites, but I love smoking new stuff. Uh, for me, cigars are like pizza. I've never had bad pizza or never had really bad sex. Like it's just good. Like even when the cigar is not great, it's a good cigar. And I enjoyed that. And I actually got my father to start smoking uh, consistently now um, because it's something that we actually bond. Uh, uh, I don't drink anymore. I like five years. So cigars was something that I, I got to do socially. And it's something that actually my dad and I have in common. Uh, because again, even when I played, it got to a point where I started golfing more because I wanted to smoke more. Uh, and while I was in the course, so I I I just enjoy a good stick. So yeah, so my cigar, I, I got into it later, and and now it's something that I enjoy doing. It's probably one of the only activities here in Chicago in the winter that I I I go to my cigar lounge. Like most people go to like their local pub. I sit there, I watch my games, I just relax. It's it's part. It's a community. You know, we talk politics, we talk life, um, and it's something that until you're in the community. Uh, I was always very scared of like, you need to be a cigar expert. And it's, it's a community where you're learning, you know, they're teaching you, they're, you know, they're, they're showing you. And I, and I enjoyed it. And here in Chicago, again, you're here in the summer, everyone, you know, everyone's got a good stick. Uh, and it's probably one of my top five activities to do. And one of the ones that I bond with my father over because, you know, we both enjoy it so much. Yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's the key right there. I mean, uh, I've said it before on the show, you know, cigars are like portable campfires, you know, you're able to bond you, whether either it's business, whether it's family, what you do with your dad. I mean, that's the idea that those, those are the memories that, that, and, and those are the, 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 the connections that, that, that a cigar can give you. So, okay. Uh, since you're, since you're in the sports world, I, I asked this of, of Casey Hogan from, from Crux Cigars. So, you you're either managing or you're a GM and you win the world series. What's your victory cigar, Ozzy Gange? You know what? I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I would probably smoke a Rocky, uh, the white label, but I have a better idea. So if I was, um, so I'm, I did it with my kids and when I actually talked to Ozzy when every time he thinks about, you know, gets interviewed or gets back in the game and I'm doing it now. I always do it with when something's I'm trying to get a goal. Okay. Uh, I'll, put a cigar on the side and says, when I reach this goal, I'm going to smoke this cigar. Usually the, the more expensive ones, but I've been trying to figure out like if I was Ozzy or like myself and I would start the season, I would buy a cigar. Okay. Or a box of cigars and have it, you know, have them put my brand on it. And, and I would, and I would say when we, when we win the division or when we win the championship, I'm smoking this box. Okay. I would literally, I would literally think about it before I did it. Uh, I have boxes for all my kids. Actually, Don Alejandro made them for me. Where when they were born, I I passed a couple out, and now I smoke only that cigar on the day of their birthdays. And I have enough that when they turn, you know, eighteen, and hopefully when they get married, and, and hopefully I'm here to smoke that. I get to smoke in those celebratory parts because again, I think that a victory cigar, and it's and it's I and it's really wild because in two thousand five. When the White Sox won in 2003 and then in 05, the two times I've, I've been a part of a World Series uh, working wise, everybody knows that I'm going to be smoking something. And everybody knows that if I'm if I'm celebrating something, because I will let people know what I'm smoking. What, what One of the things I enjoy the most about cigars, you said the bonfires, when, when you drink, OK, and you're a drinker and that's fine. You come to somebody's house and you're usually drinking the options that the, 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 that the person has. OK, but very rarely do you see if like someone's drinking scotch, the other person's drinking vodka. People kind of tend to drink what everybody else is drinking in the cigar world. You know, unless somebody gives you a cigar and says, let's smoke this same cigar at the same time. Everyone's smoking something different. Mm -hmm. You know, someone can be smoking something harder. You can be smoking something lighter. You know, my dad smokes six while I only smoke two because he smokes faster. So I really enjoy that because when I go to my friend's houses, you know, I'm, I'm, I bring my own little pack. I bring my own, you know, I bring my, my cigars. I bring, you know, my, my case and, and I'll trade cigars with them and I'll smoke what I smoke. So everybody kind of does their own thing when it comes to cigars, but everyone's join, enjoying the same activity. That I like, because I always thought, it, for me, it was always awkward. It's a Latino thing. I always thought it was awkward of like showing up like with my own bottle to like somebody's party because I knew that they weren't going to have what I liked <laughs> when I drank. Um, but that's what I enjoy about the cigar. Like it, it, it's, it's not weird that you walk into a party and all my friends do it you know, that you bring your box of cigars and you're trading cigars. And it's like, you got a like, little kids playing like baseball cards. Hey, did you smoke this? Oh, yeah. try this one. Oh, I, you know, I got an extra one of this one. I, I enjoy that a lot too. 
and this is a part of the process. Uh, I, that's that's a great analogy. It is it is the a uh, baseball card kind of thing. That that's what a, a cigar is. And I've got thanks to our buddies at J.C. Newman. I've got El Baton. So I figured that was that that would be you know sort of uh you know fitting un baton with 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 with, with the, the so so I'm gonna so this is what happened so so I have a notebook so I have a notebook okay and 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 I'm trying to kind of like take it to the next level and make it an Excel with pictures and whatnot but I, I take a note you know of the name of the cigar that I smoked or that I heard and then I kind of like you know how much did I enjoy it because when I go buy boxes and if I really enjoy it I'm like okay I'm gonna go buy. I'm going to go buy this box. I really enjoy that. Again, I enjoy smoking. Uh, you know, a lot of people stick to what they know. And I, again, there's a couple of them that I really enjoy uh, a lot. And I have boxes for those, but I, I kind of just, I, I'm, I'm an explorer. So I like finding out and saying, oh, this is a really good one. Um, and even when I read the mag, when I'm reading the magazines and whatnot, people's, you know, people are saying, you know, this one's got this rating and that. I, I, I go out and I go get it. And, I'm, I, and, I, and I literally, because I want to try it. I want to see, you know, it, do I think it was that good? Do I not? But I, I keep track of what all that I'm smoking. So I'm like, okay, I've smoked this one. So it's kind of like a, like I'm kind of like collecting, you know, in the cigar world of of, of what I'm doing. So that's another part where I enjoy that. I, I keep track of everyone that I've kind of, I, people do it for restaurants. People, I, I'm like, I track all the cigars that I've smoked uh, so I can keep a list of like whatever I have. How big is the list? It's big, man. It's big. I probably got, I probably got upwards of 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 three fifty now, um, of different types of cigar that I've that I've that I've tasted. Again, I've tasted stuff, and in Venezuela we got this one. Um, you know, they just use it. It's like they literally just make it with like with the worst part of the tobacco, and I. It's not your. It's not. I used to say it's a cigar to do It's like a. It's it, but it's um, but it's when you taste it and you're like, man, this is like what really hardcore tobacco tastes like. Right. And when you taste something that was made, you know, that was actually spent money on, but again, it goes on the list. It goes on the list. That's funny. It's kind of like gumbo. You're having a, a gumbo cigar. Whatever you can find, let's put it all together and cook it up. And yeah, and whatever you can find. And again, like if I go. And if I go somewhere, you know, when I've been to the DR and and um, you go you go to the house, I'll I'll test, I'll try the different blends, I'll try the different, uh, you know, styles of of uh, of just cigars sizes, um, and just that, like I, you know, I and discover like during this whole discovery, man, like I didn't even know that they made cigars in in tobacco in the United States, which I should have known that being a history buff, because they're still making great cigars here, um. I, I taste out like if, you know, uh, David Ortiz came out with the one a couple of years ago, uh, which which I enjoyed. My first one that I enjoyed from an athlete, you know, from an athlete's collection was uh, the Ray Lewis ones. Mm -hmm. So like I'll like I, if it comes out and I'll, and I'll go out and I'll taste it. Gary Sheffield's had a couple of them. So I, I you, if you're an athlete and you you come up with a cigar, you can guarantee one buyer already. I'm going to buy one from you. So if you're out there, you're an athlete and you're thinking about um, yeah, and like you're, I'm gonna you're buy one. Like, a phone Jenkins, call for me. Oh, well, just well, can I have one of those sticks, Eric? <laughs> for sure. Well, you know, it, what I want to do, I want to introduce. Yeah, he's been yeah, on the show. yeah, yeah. And if you say if I enjoy it, I buy the box. He's been on the show. His name is Tony Barrios. He's Venezuelan, uh, and he lives in Texas, and he does Stallone cigars. So I'm definitely going to introduce you guys, and because obviously he he makes some for good sure. out out of out of the Dallas area. So be before I let you go, Ozzy, one of the things that we've worked together in is the sports betting industry. We've done we've done shows together. We continue to do shows together. And I, I you know, and I live in Florida where there is no legal sports betting. You live in Illinois where there is. Coming from a sports background and a sports family, it, it had to be taboo. But now we see the all the leagues in bed with sports books, and I think it's great. What do you think the future and how big can the sports industry, sports betting industry get? Well, I think that number one, it is, it was taboo in my family. Ozzy had two rules, no DUIs, don't, no, no betting on sports uh, because it was illegal. And because of what happened in baseball and, you know, you don't want to be associated uh, and, and any rumors come up because of the, the accesses and the information that we had at the time. So I, definitely I was, that was something that the only times I ever made a bet before it became illegal I, I I do it when I went to Vegas and I would never do baseball. You know, I, I'd tell friends like, yeah, I, I like this team, the World Series, but I never did it. Uh, I actually really enjoyed going to Vegas a lot was because it was the only place that you could do it. Um, and, and, and that was something that, you know, was always intriguing, especially for the other sports. I think it's the future of sports from a business standpoint. I think it's what alcohol was to it in the 19 uh, after prohibition. 
uh, with the marketing and the branding and, and and kind of just people being athletes being able to use it. Uh, I think that the leagues are doing a great job of putting a point, uh, a sense of responsibility. Here's the part where people don't understand. So when you do, um, when, when you are doing, uh, when you have a line on a game, okay, the league has more of an entice to keep that game in the up and up, okay, because now there is money in that game. So when it comes to boxing, when it comes to MMA, uh, mixed martial arts, when it comes to baseball, even in the NBA, be able to see, number one, the information getting better because there, they, there's a huge gaming industry that they can come back and be affected by. But I think it's the future. I love how how easy they've made it in understanding the betting world where you can bet something as simple as a money line and a parlay and you can get that into as deep into a game as balls and strikes. Uh, so I really enjoy that. I think that every state should should have, again, to whatever their laws and they, how they want to do it. I know like here in the state of Illinois, we can't bet college, our own college teams, which is fine. You know, uh, it's it's what the state wanted, but I I love it. I think that you take the element of of illegal illegal gambling out of the way. I, I'm an honest man. People are going to gamble. They're going to do it. So might as well just put it. You know, make it uh, put up in the up and up, and get this. Let the state have uh, uh let the state have some benefits from it. Uh, you know, the way that I see it is that if it's a vice, tax it like you do other things, and let that money go to you know schooling and and facilities that help the, the rest of the state because people are going to gamble regardless. People are going to do illegal things. So the more that legal that you make it, uh, the better that it is. So again, you think there's a sense of responsibility of as, as parents and and obviously them letting people know that the consequences of gambling and the, and the situation that you could be in, but I, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I don't believe in this, in this thing that players and whatnot, I think players as a professional, there's still a sense of responsibility, just like when it was illegal of you going in and betting against your team or not betting against your team. And let's be honest, like, if you if you go you're a player and you put your social security card on on a, on a on a on a gambling account that's all being tracked like if you put a you know my I'm sure that my history of my of my betting is somewhere in a cloud somewhere so I, I really really enjoy it that the way that technology is coming in and sports and everything coming all together I really think it's a big benefit to what we are able to do and the expansion of the game I I I never thought in my lifetime that I'd be sitting here in the United States and I'd be talking about European soccer. Like I was talking about Major League Baseball, and that's because we have uh, we have a motive to to you know to to watch those games, and the leagues are growing. And same thing, I got friends in Europe that are in Spain, and they're you know they're they're they want to know now stuff about baseball and whatnot. And people in Venezuela want to ask me about you know what, the over unders on NFL and, and you know and, and yardage, and people would have never asked that you know twenty five years ago. So I'm all about. It. I think it's the future, and I think it's also the way that you watch games. There's people that watch the game of baseball for entertainment. They don't care like my wife. They're just having a good time. They just want to see a couple of guys hit home runs. And get, there's guys like me that watch the game to judge managers and players and, and analytics. And, and I'm judging the game from a baseball aspect. And now I watch games from a gambling aspect. I, I could care less if the manager's making a bad move. I'm watching the manager to make a bad move because I want my odds to get better from the man, from the guy that you're watching. in. so even myself, I'm watching games now where I want the broadcasters where I'm watching and I'm listening, you know, to you guys, I, you know, in BetQ, I'll give out like lines and whatnot beforehand. I'm watching the game completely different. So it's funny when I'm watching the game now, it's like, what am I watching the game for? Am I watching this for entertainment, which is now it's very rare. OK, am, am I watching it for analyzing the game of baseball, which now it's even more rare because I'm not in the game of baseball. I'm not broadcasting the game. I'm not, you know, I'm not scouting or I'm not doing that. I'm watching it from a betting standpoint. You know, man, this guy's really good with the first, you know, going on the first pitch. I might put some action on that. So I think that that's going to change and fans are going to watch it for different reasons. And that's great because that means more fans. I love it. And I, and I always remind people the biggest sports betting scandals were uncovered and stopped by legal sports books. It, the, the, you make it legal, more eyes are on it and more scrutiny and more ways to keep it above board. That's what I always remind people. That's the best way to do it. Listen, Ozzy, I love chatting with you, man. You you are you are a man of all seasons, brother. You, your father, it's sports better, cigar aficionado, everything, man. I enjoy hanging out with you. And listen, we got to make this trip. Forget coming to Miami. We're going to Chicago. We're going to Gibson's. We're getting a big old steak. We're smoking some stogies, and we're making some bets, okay? I love it. That's a great plan, my friend. It's always a pleasure being on with you. Uh, looking forward to being on again, working-wise, hanging out-wise, again, Mi casa tu casa. Chicago's open. Probably when you come, it's probably not going to be too cold. But again, we got great indoor places in the city. I, I, I am a Miami kid now. Gracias. So I will definitely see you about June when we go to Chicago. Or when the Dodgers get up to Chicago, then I'll, then I'll come and see you. June 
<laughs> you know, for those for those two and Perfect. a half, three Perfect. weeks. I love it. Great plan. That's what. Have I'll a say. good one. All right, buddy. That's Ozzy Gia Jr. here on the Blend. 